Okay, we'll move on to borrower record cleanup by Jane. All right, so recently I was doing some borrower cleanup of my own, and I was basically running across records that were somebody owed five cents from ten years ago. Um, and um, I started thinking at the time, why are we retaining these records? Um, the quarterly purge that Telco does right now, they essentially are purging um, people who don't have any monetary fines at, or manual blocks and have been expired for two or more years. So I started thinking about this. I want to bring it up for discussion. Um, this morning when I was looking at it, I decided to go a little further with it because I didn't want to just kind of bring something and just have this open-ended question. Um, so if you could scroll down, I sent this out just a little bit before the meeting. I apologize for sending out so late today. Could you scroll down? Yes, please. So here's an example of a record. They had five cents on their account since 2008, so they're not being purged. If you go down to the next page, you'll see another example of you know, a borrow record. Um, this person owes five dollars, but this is going back to 1998. So, I mean, to me, it doesn't seem. You know, I know that Telco is interested in general. I believe in doing general database maintenance, right? Because you don't want to just keep cluttering up the database. Um, there's one more example if you, if you want to look at it. Um, so here we have 20 cents going back to 2001. So, yeah. you know. <laughs> As friends to me, are you sure you don't want that five cents they might pay someday? Well, you know. <laughs> um, so if you wouldn't mind going back to the first page. So and I tried. Some of those women, excuse me, Michelle Patrick, um, if their names have changed even now, and they could be even in their system under a different name. Yeah. 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 Or deceased. Or deceased. Yeah. Because yeah. they deal with it. Yeah. Yeah. We have no process for purging deceased borrowers. Right? Yeah. Uh, so I tried, in Red Reporter, I tried running some statistics on the number of borrowers who meet some of these basic criteria of how many years or having manual blocks. And the report was so large, I couldn't even run it. So I took a subset of Goodyear County just to see. You know, right now in Goodyear County, we have almost 43% of our borrowers in the database are expired, which to me it seems really, really large. Um, and just kind of going down the list, you see you know, people who had fines of more than uh, five dollars or less for more than five years, one thousand three hundred and twenty five just from Goodyear County alone. So I'm wondering if libraries might you know, when we start talking fines and fees, I know it gets a little dicey because people might have their own opinions, but I was trying to think of a way maybe we could come up with a rule to purge borrowers who owe a certain amount has been expired for a certain length of time. Um, I also feel it's beneficial in the sense that when we do report some some libraries say, oh, I have so many borrowers. Well, if 43% of your borrowers are expired, you don't really have 10,000 borrowers. You have 5,000 or thereabouts. So, so that's kind of where I'm at. I made up a proposal. I understand there's a competing proposal on the table. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was more of a, a way to get the conversation going. I imagine this would be the sort of thing that we would have to put up for a request for comment because of yep. the sensitivity of dealing with fines and things. But um, the ones that do, do they have five dollars in fines or five dollars less that all of these are inactive? They haven't they've been inactive for two years. So in other words they haven't I said five. You did five years. But so they have not checked five. out an item in at least five years yep. and potentially even longer. So so, I'm mean, counting Yes. Yes. It counts every person who has a record. No. No. We should only be counting active. Well, there are reports where you can you, you can count transacting borrowers, which is what I typically run instead to get a more accurate idea of what what people are doing in the system. Um, and you'll find that number is a lot lower than the borrower count. But the active borrowers are just considered to be those who are using the search system or actually checking something else. So I think you may have active borrowers who are not active checking things out. Well, we have active borrowers who use the computers. Yes, or we do. Yeah. yeah. But 
but they wouldn't they wouldn't be expired. Right, right. Sure. How's that work? <laughs> so I, this is Anne. I'm going to jump in. So James is absolutely right. Sokol's so -called commitment is that we keep the databases, plural, and clean quality control. We spend a tremendous amount of effort, especially recently, on the bib records. We have been less inclined to touch patron records because we don't, I mean, if you were to run a cell patron report, I think we have 80. That's it. So we are less inclined to clean up patron records because they really are more your patrons. Um, probably less worried now, I mean, in years, years, years gone by, there were some county funding formulas that had a factor of borrower counts. And so nobody wanted anybody touching anybody's patron records because if that person was registered by Zimbroda, I mean, by golly, you were going to keep your patron because I couldn't have that patron. But other than maybe, um, I don't think that there is anybody currently on the automation system that uses a funding formula that re that involves patron count that I know of. So that, that ownership, so that was one of the reasons why SoCo pretty much had a hands-off of borrow, borrow, patron records. I can't get those eyes out today. So I love the idea that this would clean up the database as long as we can figure out a decision on a, a dueling proposal. Well, well, uh, purged every year? Right, we purge the records that don't, do not have blocks on them. Okay, so if you have any kind of block, like James was saying, manual or automatic, the, the program we use it won't, it won't delete them. And the block that I love that Cheryl reminded me of is in 2005, December, when we discontinued the bookmobile, we moved all of those patrons to the closest physical location of a public library. And so to send a signal as to, you know, suddenly this was a Medford patron who you had never seen in the Owatonna patron world, and why the patron B set or I type or B type or whatever was maybe not what you were normal. We put a block in every single one of those bookmobile patron records that said former bookmobile patron. Well, we were dealing with tens of thousands of bookmobile patrons, and some of those blocks are still out there. 760 of them. <laughs> to throw a little history into this. Um, so what, what we've been doing, and Cheryl is going to jump in and correct me if I get this wrong, because I haven't personally had to deal with this for a while. Um, every year we send out a report showing patrons at each library that will not get purged because they have some... Other way, they will get purged. They will be purged, they will be purged um, because they don't have any blocks and they fit the criteria. And then the, the thinking was always that the libraries would look through their patrons and kind of remove some of those what I call trivial blocks. That's just a personal choice of words and it may not be the best one. But some of those less critical blocks so that some of those patrons can get purged. I don't think we've ever had a lot of luck with that. I think that's the kind of task that just nobody really has time for, to be honest. So I think it makes a lot of sense for Selco to take a little more responsibility for seeing that this gets done. I think this is a good place where we can help out. Okay, this is Sherry at St. Charles. Actually, I think you've had that kind of reversed. Well, I, um, Cheryl had sent out a link, this, a couple links this time, which thank you, thank you for it. This is how you can generate the report of patrons who have blocks. This is how you generate one with small fines. I spent the better part of a day going through and deleting manual blocks. We also have blocks added, I believe, when Rochester split for its own system. Had almost had county cards, because I had a lot from the summer of 2003. Okay. I think um, that's great that you did that. I think you're uh, kind of unusual. So I think that's just the whole thing that we, we can help out a little bit with, and I yeah. think that would be a good thing to do. My only objection would be that my county does do that. They want to know how many county borrows, and they want to pay just 
for that little group of county borrowers. But then you're counting by borrowers or you're counting by CERC? Borrowers. In other words, we have registered borrowers. I can't even say it today. Borrowers. Yes. But this goes back to Michelle's question. Are you, do you want to actually give an accurate count? No, I want an inflated count. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I don't know how else to put it because the, the county literally, you know, how many patrons are we paying for? And, um, and that's what they want to pay for. And now with their MOE considerably less than what they're giving me, you know, if I show a deep decrease in the county borrowers, They ask for it. How many city, how many counties? And for us, you know, being the only library, that means that this isn't, isn't going to be diverted sources, it's just going to be our source. So. Well, the. See, a real strong point that that's beside the point. What? No. Yeah. Any more than I can say, as a city employee, as a city resident, I pay more tax, county taxes. And I do city taxes and I get nothing for it. So technically, as far as I'm concerned, all of our patrons should be county. But I don't think that would go over the right This is Sherry again. Um, did Telco do something like this previously? Because I have some old, old finds and blocks, but I don't have any from before 2000. So I am thinking maybe before we migrated that. Well, you just saw one from 1990. I know, you do, but I didn't on any of my patrons. So I'm wondering if maybe we had the option of asking Selco to do this. There might be precedent. They're, they're, they're really, um, that I don't remember, okay. Sherry, but, if, but really, if, okay. you don't, if, if James has some um, from 1998 yeah. and you don't I don't have think any. I had any before 2000, which is what made me think. That then maybe we did some cleanup, but that might have been voluntary. Right. Sherry may have done some cleanup. No, I wouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that would have been a logic, okay. um, you know, because we would have, when we migrated. Tried to clean up. The patron database in 2003, um, you know, we would have hopefully tried to migrate the cleanest records, most relevant patron data. So I, but I, honest to goodness, there was so much that we did 13, 11 years ago that I can't remember what we, what we did or didn't do. What are you finding? Oh, I don't see anything under Sherry in either of the two. Um, categories that they listed before 2002. I signed one in 2002. So, so that would have been that would have been roughly that time that maybe because but I went through and cleaned a bunch up right last week too. Okay. Uh, this is Pat from Stewartville. I have a question. When you every so often uh, somebody wants to get a new library card, and we'll have multiple. They've got two or three or four cards out there, and We'd like to know how you want that handled. I mean, because most of those cards all have big fines on them. So what is the best procedure for this? I mean, they we don't want to be just taking out, you know, just waiving their fines or something. How do you want us to handle that? We don't issue the card. Is that not a, that that's not a in our case, it's a local policy issue. If we find the card, we absolutely do not issue yeah. a new yeah. one. Yeah. We don't issue an, a new one from Stewartville. We do not do that. But what I'm thinking of is you got they've got three cards out there. Now, they may have one physical card, and, and they don't think you know they've got cards at two other libraries. And in most cases, we are telling them we will not uh, check out to you until you call these other libraries and get the fines taken care of at those particular libraries. But, but you're talking about if sums greater than a, a dollar. Well, we're talking 10, 15 or more. No, I, think, I, think, I don't think this would affect this. No. This, I think James, oh. James is looking at the fact that he picked $5. I mean, okay. you could also say that we're going to eliminate only people who have inconsequential, yeah. 
as opposed to frivolous blocks. Like, you know, the person who has a block that says their umbrella is at the library, and, you know, truly, if the, if the block is your umbrella was left at the library, Ten years ago, <laughs> that block is still blocking us from her there. So, well, and, you know, no. so right, and what and, and that is part. So there are kind of a couple different components to this, and one of them is what Ann's saying. You know, and we put blocks on all the time and say, "Hey, your card's in the drawer." Well, then after ten years, their card's still in the drawer. They're not getting purged automatically because there's a block on the record, and you see up there. That's the first sort of percentage there, 21.95%. So 22% of Goodyear County cards have a manual block. And that means 22% will never get purged at the way we currently do the procedures. So. And, and this is, will only affect inactive borrowers, correct? Yes. Yes. So, yes. And the first criteria is that they have to be expired and have been inactive for two years after that. Right, not just expired. So they have to have been expired for two years, and on top of that, for them to have expired two years prior, they had to have been inactive themselves for three years. Okay. So, so you're adding five years from from the beginning. Okay. Right. Oh, you're right. Yeah. Okay. So that's what I was hoping. Right. So yeah. This is this oh, is okay. Dan. So. So I understand that cleaning up the database feels. Yeah, I mean, I, I like things tidy also, but does it, will it improve functionality in any way to do this? The database will sigh. Will it be any faster? Or will it just kind of make us feel like we cleaned our pencil drawer? I mean, do you know what I mean? I mean, I'm not trying to be trivial because I, I, I see the advantage of the transacting borrowers, which I was just, because I'm over here, I was looking at, I was just comparing some numbers I had from 2006 on transacting borrowers compared to now. So I, I get that, but, you know, this, I don't know how much work it'll be to do all of that. Maybe it's really easy, but, I mean, what, what do we get for okay. the effort and the conversation okay. other than yeah, just that cleaned it up? Maybe not. So uh, this is Donovan. To be honest, I don't think we will see a real tangible improvement in system performance or anything like that. So we should be clear about that. Um, a question I'm not really qualified to answer is I wonder if library staff working on CERC desks and, and such will see some improvement in just not having so many patron records to wade through. Um, as they're trying to go about their business. And that's something there's other people who, are, who can answer better than me. Okay. Um, as far as the work involved in doing it, and I'm looking to Cheryl to make sure I don't say something dumb here. Um, she kind of keeps me from doing that. Um, we can automate this process. I think the real work is involved in deciding what the criteria is going to be. And James has done a really good idea, a deep, good job of pulling some ideas there. I know Cheryl's got some thoughts on that as well. If we can decide on that, then after that it's pretty much just a matter of automated scripts. Okay, okay. Well, and I'm not opposed, and I, I like things neat and tidy too, and I don't want junk lying around either. But I was just wanting to make sure that it was going to be m measuring the benefit against the cost. Well, so but, you know, with databases in general, you do want to keep them clean, right? I mean, there is and potentially a minimal impact from this one thing on performance, but it's just one part of maintaining a large database. Reports should be easier to work. Plus, when you go to, yeah, and that's just it, pulling out a report with a lot of bars, I can't even do it in a web report because there's so many in there. Um, there's also, right. if you ever decide to switch companies and you're going to do a database extraction, you're going to be paying on a certain amount of records, right? If they're charging you on patron records, Okay. Then all of a sudden, what we're going to do this massive cleanup right before we migrate, you know. So I just think that this is just part of an ongoing process. But I don't work technically at Soco, so that was just my thought. I agree with everything you said. Yeah, I agree with that. And you are talking, I mean, there's going to be hundreds of thousands of lines of database code that is going to be being deleted because every borrower is seven places in the database. 
Um, That'll feel and, good. And and I like it. I like it that it's sort of <laughs> relatively easy to, and that there are probably harder things that we would want to do next. So, you know, that's that's kind of cool. <laughs> The umbrella at the desk is one small example. I mean, most of them are things like, we'll pay fine next time. You know, just notes to each other that meant something at that time that have never gotten resolved. So they've just hung around for 10 levels. And it's the best place to put those notes because, especially with us, especially your card is at the desk. If the patron says, I can't find my library card. Oh, we have it here. Can they pull up the show it off, by the way? Because we seem rather significant to me, not just the numbers. Well, a number of these blocks that I have seen have been like, no one else has. Patrons allowed to check out PG-13 movies. Patrons can use the computer. And these ones just keep them stuck in the system for forever. Well, the thing is, the norm, under the normal purging, they would have expired and been purged. But because we've always had the rule, but if they have this block, they're not going to get purged along with everyone else. So why why not? If they don't know a fine and they picked up their umbrella and someone forgot to take it off, or they never picked up their umbrella and it's been 10 years, are they going to pick up their umbrella? <laughs> <laughs> Probably not. It was an umbrella. Unless it's raining for a week straight and they can't think of anything else. You know, I... <laughs> so you could have them purge manual ones with manual blocks but not lines and scenes as separate functions. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And I guess so my thought was, and this is sort of what I proposed, there's kind of two components. So there's the manual block thing and I, I just think that when SOPA does their purge, they should add all the manual blocks into that Excel list. And if you want to keep them, you can do a do not purge block or whatever, or you can go on and manually renew them yourself. And then and also so that, to me, that makes a lot of sense. The, yeah. the second part of this would be also the fact that we have borrowers who rolled five cents from ten years ago. Do we need to keep these borrowers? I think that's a little bit more of a touchy issue because you'd have to decide on a, you know, an a length of dollars, ten dollars, one way. Right. But that's assuming others see the need for this at all. So Cheryl had also prepared a document. Yeah. That we're going to talk about it's it today. Very similar. I wonder why. Great <laughs> <laughs> <Straight> mind. <laughs> and what does Cheryl say? So that's our current process, right? You guys probably all got an email about that a couple weeks ago. I hope. I think this is something that we need to go think about. I think it sounds like a good idea, but I want to make sure that there's not some pitfall that I'm not. Sure. Well, I I would think I think I mentioned this to Anne, maybe not the group, but I would imagine we would want to do a request for comment type on this sort of process because it does involve monetary amounts. Well, and I thought maybe that with the new forum being right. launched right. June 3rd, We've got a holiday in three days, so it's not like June 3rd is so far away as to be one. We could have this topic be our first topic of general discussion on the forum, because you're right, Peggy. We found that as knowledgeable as this group is about your own library operations, you've got some thing that's going on at another location that we go, oh my goodness, you know. They've chosen to use the system this way, and our decision really affected them. So we could we could put this out as the first discussion and have it a two-part discussion. The manual blocks that are the umbrella-like thing, or yes, my child who was eight ten years ago, the non-monetary, and they do the non-monetary things, and then maybe have a different discussion about. What is the threshold of finance that you would be comfortable as a library director saying will waive because it's this amount of money and it's also 
<laughs> 10 years ago. That would be, that's where I would, I don't know that we need to go. The, the request for input was a much more formal process. I think maybe we could do it quicker. Well, that's kind of what I wrote, because thank you. we had kind of had some conversations obviously. at lunch. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Can you share again, Cheryl, if you put that up, maybe indicate what those categories are. There oh, was sure. ACR yeah. is address correction, but... Message note, message note, address correction, bad borrower, cell phone bookmobile, and never send notice. And then oh, I have okay. a whole list of other okay. blocks. Yeah. Those were just the ones I put in as quick examples. Okay. So. Now this would be expired for two more years and have no fine. Right. Yeah. Right. So no other blocks except for those. They have it's yeah, it's in those categories. So yeah, that's how it's written. Right. Well, I had said as long as those 760 borrowers that were the bookmobile were truly Falco bookmobile, I told Cheryl, get rid of those. I mean, I'm enough of an administrator, I can make that decision. <laughs> well, we do have a library that when their purged borrower list comes out, they manually go in and make everyone Whatever code they need to add, they purge no one ever. Well, Even as Peggy was saying, you know, she wants that. to play her account. <laughs> and it's not Peggy. Can, I know. No, I know, but I'm just saying she could do that every time this list comes out. But I, I do. There, is, I do have a philosophical disagreement with doing that type of activity in the system because it's not an accurate representation of your borrower base. And most people have accurate records. If I ask you how many papers you got, normally you give me an accurate number. Yeah. yeah. We don't say, oh, by the way, here's the circulation number, and now I'm going to triple it because... Because I, I want to. No. But we do, we do allow each library to make a decision on how they are going to administer their, their budgets their patrons, their staffing procedures. So if a library wants to take a look at the list that Cheryl sends out and manually go in and say don't purge for every single one of their expired, long expired patrons, we've, we've allowed them to do so. And that says when we discussed at lunch is that this would be part of that list that is sent out. Right. The, these are ones that will be purged. So yeah. you'll still get a chance to review any of the ones that we purged this way. So how would you like us to proceed? We're looking for your advice today. I mean, so this is the type of group where you make a motion? It is. <laughs> <laughs> or, or you can make you can make a suggestion and everybody nods, John. I think we should put it out on the forum. Yeah. That'll be yeah. good. Yeah. First topic. Um, keep it on the agenda for this meeting, and we would potentially make formal action in the future based on input from. And when would be the next time we would purge? Um, I'm doing a purge um, June 1st, I think. So then the I next said. time would be September. September. So no, 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 we could do the normal purge to yeah, that next week. Yeah. Or I can do another one in between there. Or we can yeah. say, you know, that the, this new procedure would not take place until September. So you've got time to talk to people. You, there may be some people who have to go to their board. Okay. I don't think. Do we need a motion then? Who's our who's our taker of the note? Do you need a motion? I don't need one. I can put one in if people want to take one. <laughs> consensus. It's not like there's a broad consensus. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Don't have a Got it. Woo Okay, so we'll move on then to uh, network manager transition by Donovan. So I'm sure everyone has heard that uh, Dave Stenman, our longtime network manager, is moving on to other opportunities. So um, we are, fr or not frankly, we are feverishly, <laughs> not feverishly, uh, we are diligently moving forward <laughs> trying to make the transition uh, and prepare for his departure. Uh, the systems team is is working very hard with Dave to try and get as much information out of him as we can. Uh, over the years, Dave has been a very prolific documenter. 
So he has written a lot of information. Um, so everyone is busily assimilating that. We are cleaning up some of that information to make sure that we have updated information on the places we go for support on various products and the details of various procedures. We've broken up the tasks that he's responsible for and divvied those out, mostly to other members of the team, um, although there are a few things that are actually touching on the ILS team um, that Cheryl works with, uh, mostly involved with e-commerce um, through the catalog, for example. Um, so we are making the preparation as best we can um, to make sure that everything continues running just the way it has been. Um, Moving forward, uh, we do have a process underway to uh, hire a new network um, specialist. Um, the first thing we did, we took a hard look at the and how it fit in with the rest of the department. Um, anytime someone leaves, it's a good time to take a look at what they were doing and can there be a change made that works a little more efficiently. Um, in this case, we elected not to make significant changes to the job. Um, we still feel like we do need someone specializing in network operations. So we do have a job opening up on the website for a network specialist. And the uh, responsibilities didn't change a whole lot. We updated a little language, but that was about it. The, um, this job opening is out there, and we are taking applications. Uh, we are scheduled to review those applications on June 16th. And we intend to do interviews on June 23rd through June 25th, and then hopefully hire someone shortly thereafter. So we are moving ahead on this as quickly as we can while making sure that we are ready to the interim. And I would be happy to take any questions or comments on that. Or I can talk more at length about it. So and, um, I do have a question. Yeah. In your discussions of kind of the future of this position, and um, especially having come back from the Kosugi conference and listening to Blue Cloud sort of technologies, is Selco looking towards the future of cloud-based and the maintenance of in-house servers and how this position might fit into that role? We are. And if anything, this position becomes more important as we move forward into more cloud-managed solutions. The website migration, for example, that I talked about, as we decommission servers here, we're moving those solutions to providers in the cloud. So internet connectivity to reach those solutions, both here and at the libraries, becomes even more important than it was before. Um, and that's not just keeping the connections up and running. It's also planning ahead for the future, trying to figure out where to best apply our resources for bandwidth upgrades, um, and just general management. So I think the network specialist becomes even a little more important in that scenario. Now, we have a systems team, which includes the network specialist and our systems manager, as well as our web specialist, web development specialist, and our um, user technology manager. And they all closely together. We try to keep information from being siloed. So everyone is expected to have a little bit of knowledge about what their peers are doing. So for example, if Dave's gone and there's a firewall question, the rest of the team at least has enough information that they're not completely helpless. So, so I, I don't see this position probably ever going away. If anything, it's going to become more important as we move more into the cloud. Okay, anything else on there? Uh, do we have any announcements? We do. We do. We have an exciting announcement that truly came in on my email like three seconds ago. I am happy to announce that we got partial funding, significant partial funding on Collection HQ. Um, where they, they gave, they approved both the CELCO application for the Collection HQ were $5,776 less than we asked for. Certainly we can, um, we can do it for $5,000 less. 
and um, the CELS project to automate the Red Wing High School um, also was approved, um, less $4,779, but we can certainly, who knows, I don't know um, that one, but you know, it's, the, the letter says they have been funded um, at a slightly lesser amount. So I'll take approval. But for this group who was excited about Collection HQ and continuing our database cleanup project, um, we just got approved for $51,981 effective July 1st. Woohoo! Congratulations. Mary Kay will be doing a presentation at our next ILSOP. <laughs> <laughs> All the uses that Owatonna has made out of Collection HQ. <laughs> but you're part of this project too, so we'll see how we can roll you in. In all seriousness, it would be great if Renee gave us an update. <laughs> <laughs> Assign it to somebody else. So yeah, Charlie, you just meant to jump in there. <laughs> okay, any other announcements? I see that we have a tentative meeting on June 19th, and then it would be <laughs> July 17th, the next meeting, depending on Right? Probably. That's right. I just took a calendar to make sure I know the dates. But. Well, I'm just going off the sheet. <laughs> on the sheet so. This group, Charlie, has tend usually been meeting about every other month. Know, right? We tend to keep it on the calendar, and Heather sends out a call for topics. And if there's a quietness, then we cancel. It's easier right. to take something off your calendar than try to add it on. Right. Okay. Anything else? If not, I will adjourn the meeting. I'm sure nobody's in a hurry to get outside today. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>